darkness imprisoning me. All that I see, absolute horror. Alan Wake was an action horror hybrid released in 2010. Published by Microsoft and developed by Remedy of Max Payne fame, Alan Wake is a Stephen King, David Lynch, and Mark Z. Danielowski inspired romp that's written by Sam Lake. To me, Sam Lake has always kind of been like the western equivalent of Hideo Kojima, you know, if Hideo Kojima could actually write to save his life. What I'm getting at is Lake is a very talented man. Taking notes from the two Max Payne games and Resident Evil 4 before it, Alan Wake tried to fill an action game frame with horror game material, all while retaining a heavy focus on storytelling. I'd say there's about a 50-50 split between the gameplay and story here, maybe leaning slightly more heavily in the narrative's direction. It's a mind-bending horror story that the bastion of valid information TV tropes describes as the video game equivalent of House of Leaves. Sam Lake cited the book as an influence, and having experienced both, it isn't hard to see why the comparison is made. Enough of that preamble though, today we'll judge Alan Wake's merits as an action game, a horror game, how it's all presented to the player, and try to decipher the game's story as best we can. Being the first thing Remedy released since Resident Evil 4 changed the third person shooter game, they abandoned the aiming scheme from the Max Payne games in favor of the over the shoulder perspective. However, rather than just go with the flow like most other games in the industry were doing at the time and copying the aiming verbatim, Alan Wake has one of the most inventive uses of it I've personally seen. It was one of the first games I can recall that allowed you to swap between right and left handed aiming perspectives on the fly, had the flashlight double as the aiming reticle, and in a move that's still one of a kind, the game lets you adjust between two types of aiming modes. If you hold down the left trigger halfway, then you enter a soft aim, while holding the trigger all the way down enters the hard aim, that focuses the flashlight, but expends battery life. This ties into another unique feature of Alan Wake, which is how the flashlight fills a few different roles. It's the primary light source, the aiming reticule, and a weapon with ammo in its own right. The core gimmick of Alan Wake's combat is that every enemy is largely invincible due to a coat of darkness which envelops them. Once the darkness is removed, enemies can be killed. How do you remove it? Simple, you use light. In this aspect, the flashlight is kind of a gun in its own right, with batteries acting as the ammo. Running out of batteries, while unlikely to happen unless the player is completely careless with how they use them, isn't a death sentence. The flashlight does recharge itself slowly, meaning that you do always have that fighting chance. Popping a battery in does give an immediate boost to power, but the real genius here is how a single battery only gives half a full bar's recharge. Meaning, when you're confronted with stronger opponents, you have to make the choice between continually using batteries to keep a constant stream of light on the target, or taking breaks in between to not burn through your battery resources. Other light based weapons include the disposable flares you can either hold for a shield or place as a blockade, the flashbangs that are basically just regular grenades here, and the flare gun, essentially this game's version of the BFG 9000. The other guns in the player's arsenal are much more bog standard, with a revolver, two shotguns, and a bolt action rifle. The revolver is the workhorse with the most available ammo, and the other three are the power weapons that each have their own ups and downs in relation to power and firing rate. It's nothing remarkable, but it's worth noting how fantastic Alan Wake's auto-aim system is. Hit the right trigger on its own without aiming, and you'll just fire off a shot. However, so long as you're pointing Alan towards which enemy you desire to shoot, made easy by the flashlight which always points forwards without needing manual aim, you'll be almost guaranteed to hit the desired target. What doesn't work out so well is the game's dodge mechanic. On controller, which I used for this playthrough, please don't bully me, the dodge is performed by pushing the left stick in the direction you want to dodge and tapping the left shoulder button, which is also the same button you hold to sprint. This is extremely finicky, and occasionally the dodge won't come out at all, instead Alan will just do a half sprint in the direction you're pointed towards. Other games have a similar setup, with the dodge and sprint sharing the same button, but Alan Wake has two things holding its implementation back. The dodge animation is somewhat unclear, with Alan doing this odd half crouch and slide thing, and the sprint command takes priority over the dodge command. At least I think, correct me if I'm wrong. In my opinion, you really want the dodge to be instantaneous, with the sprint having a slight delay if they're going to be on the same button, and in Alan Wake's case that definitely would have been better. That or just give the dodge its own dedicated button. And just a minor, minor pet peeve here, the lack of a stamina bar to show how much longer you can do the full sprint for is annoying. You easily could have put that near the health bar. The enemy roster is somewhat lacking here as well, with little variety and an existing cast that gets familiar real quick. 
most of the time you'll just be fighting shadow people, called the Taken. Now in the game's defense, there are a fair amount of different Taken, but at the end of the day they're still just humanoid enemies that look nearly identical to the untrained eye. On the other hand, the non-humanoid enemies fare much worse. The crows are just irritating obstacles, which after a while I just ignore entirely. And then there's the possessed objects, which come to life, float around for a while, then fly a user projectile. This was apparently a bug with object physics that Remedy decided to make into a feature in the game, which, while a cool story, doesn't actually make for a very compelling combat encounter. The boss fights with big vehicles in particular really leave a lot to be desired. However, even with all of these issues, I really do have to stress just how well done the combat system of Alan Wake is. Once the Taken hop on screen and an encounter starts, the fights have a unique flow with removing their defenses with light, be it your flashlight, an item, or an environmental method, before finishing them off with a standard attack. Alan Wake starts slow, but as it gets going, the combat arenas get more hectic and really keep you on your toes. However, it's honestly brought down by the repetition of it all. Most of what I've listed about Alan Wake's combat will be seen by the player by the time they reach Chapter 3. Alan Wake is a roughly 8 or 9 hour game spread across 6 chapters, give or take. And in my opinion, you could have shaved the chapters down a bit to turn the game into a 6 or 7 hour experience. Again, while the combat is itself very fun and unique, I can't help but feel that Remedy shows their cards too early with all the interesting combat features. With a few odd exceptions, the game really doesn't add much to the mix after Chapter 3. More enemy types would have gone a long way to ease repetition, but outside of the combat itself, some additional environmental variety would have been nice too. Now, Wake is pretty well known for its depiction of Pacific Northwest forestry, as these kind of environments take up the vast majority of Alan Wake's playtime. There are a few exceptions to this, most notably a portion of a chapter that takes place within the city streets of Twin P, I mean Bright Falls, and the final brief portion at the bottom of the lake in the game's final chapter, but for the most part, Alan Wake doesn't leave its well-worn path in dark spooky forests. This isn't to disparage the forests as they appear in the game, far from it. I doubt any other video game depicts this exact environment anywhere near as well as Remedy did in Alan Wake. But some new scenery once in a while would be nice, you know? But the little moments of it already in the game go a long way. Just look at the sequence where you fight a wave of enemies while jamming out to a bunch of metal on a concert stage, with pyrotechnics popping off the entire time. This was completely unexpected on first run, and the moment was much stronger because of that. To sum up, while Alan Wake can be slightly clunky with how a few of its features are implemented, and I found it to be a bit repetitive as it went on, the core of its action gameplay is rock solid. I'd expect nothing less from a studio of this pedigree, but the fact remains that Alan Wake at the best of times is a fun and unique shooter that shouldn't be ignored for these merits alone. However, action is only one chunk of the Alan Wake hole, so let's see how it fares as a horror title. Described on the game's website as the body of an action game with the mind of a psychological thriller, Alan Wake as a horror game suffers from a similar issue that it does as an action game. Let's walk through one scare as an example. In the fourth chapter, you walk up to a cabin with a truck running outside of it, which you saw pull in not too long ago. As you enter the cabin, you hear a man scream an unfathomable cry of pain as something unknown attacks him. You walk up the stairs to confront whatever in God's name it is, and see a wounded, clearly dying man utter his final words to you, about his friend, or, at least, what his friend once was. You hear a crash downstairs, and as you slowly descend from the steps to confront whatever unholy aberration killed this man, you encounter one of the enemies you fought many, many times before. Spooky. This sums up one of the bigger issues with Alan Wake as a horror game is that a lot of the scares in the game are just groups of enemies that you've already fought before. It's samey, and predictability is the bane of horror media. Something can be scary a few times, at most, but if you keep doing the same scare over and over, it loses the power it once had. However, while I did say earlier that I wouldn't have minded some greater environmental variety, I have nothing but praise for the world design when judging Alan Wake from outside a purely gameplay perspective. I can't think of any other game that presents dark, spooky forests as well as Alan Wake does. The atmosphere is absolutely stellar. 
the lack of music for most sections of it, the diegetic audio of animals running through the bushes, rivers running, enemies stalking in the dark, all of it really just places you right in the moment. Just speaking for the audio work as a whole too, it's all very well done. The flares and flashbangs have just the right respective sounds to give off a sense of constant security and instant force respectively, the flashlight burning off the shadows of enemies is great, and the Taken's vocal distortion is both interesting and suitably creepy. But the voice cast is also solid across the board, with even minor characters having a decent amount of personality coming from line delivery. And there's a hell of a lot of it too, a lot that's easily missed. From the Twilight Zone parody show you can find on TVs scattered around the chapters, to the optional voice clips from characters you can overhear just by sticking around them for longer than you're intended to, there's so much good material you can easily pass over. This is the kind of thing many developers would be scared of putting into their games out of fear of players missing it, so I respect Remedy for placing so much attention to detail on material you can easily pass over. A minor gripe though, I personally found Alan's voice acting to be a little odd. Not bad, just odd. In the cutscenes, the actor's performance is very well done. He bounces off the other characters well and delivers his lines to conviction. What isn't as good is the Max Payne style narration that Alan gives all throughout the game. While it's not bad or annoying or anything, it can sound a little stilted and wooden compared to how James McCaffrey did it in the Max Payne games. And honestly, the contrast between Alan's cutscene delivery and Alan's narration delivery takes some getting used to. Moving back to the atmosphere, we can't ignore how well done the visual depiction of the forests are. They're dense with foliage and layered enough to really appear as dense as the real thing, which in turn masks the loading to allow the player to run through the forest as a seamless whole. Well, mostly masks the loading. The daytime sections do have some noticeable pop-up. Ah well, can't win them all. At night though, no other game really captures that feel of being lost in the woods, surrounded by things that would prefer you dead to alive, and even if I found the actual scares to be a bit flaccid, Alan Wake is a masterwork at setting a spooky scene. On the whole though, I found a lot of the game's horror content not really meshing with the game's action content. It's attempting to be an example of both genres while not fully adhering to the tropes and expectations of either. This lack of genre conformity might very well be intentional, however, and in my reading is directly linked with the story and themes of Alan Wake. Alan Wake follows the title character and his wife Alice going on a vacation to the Pacific Northwest town of Bright Falls. Alan is a writer by profession, and after finishing off his best-selling series about a hard-boiled detective, he's struck with a case of writer's block and goes on the trip to try and clear his head. After walking into an obvious trap by accepting cabin keys from the obvious villain, Alan and Alice settle into the cabin to try and relax. The mood is ruined though by Alice attempting to get Alan off his ass to do his job, sparking an argument that ends with Alan walking out in a fit of anger. This tantrum is cut short by Alice being attacked in the cabin by an unseen force and being dragged into the lake. Diving after Alice, Alan then wakes up inside of a crashed car with no idea how he got there. After being attacked by shadow people, the same kind that he saw in his nightmare earlier, Alan begins to find pages of a manuscript with a couple of odd details. First off, the manuscript is allegedly written by Alan himself despite how he has no memory of actually putting pen to paper so to speak. Secondly, the mystery manuscript seems to be detailing events before they actually happen, predicting to the T how events play out. Alan's objectives then become clear. Find out what happened to and how to rescue Alice, discover the source of the supernatural occurrences like the Taken, and find out what exactly is going on with the prophetic manuscript. The story of Alan Wake is probably the game's most compelling feature. While the game is genuinely fun to play, if somewhat the victim of repetition, the story is compelling from beginning to end. The pace is ideal, never lingering too long on one scene or idea, focuses on an enjoyable cast of characters brought to life with solid performances, and tackles some pretty thought-provoking themes and ideas. The nature of free will, a creator's self-deprecation of their own skills as an artist, the power of art itself, there's a fair bit of ways to read Alan Wake. It's a surprisingly layered story, with plenty left open to the interpretation of an invested player. While its influences do show pretty clearly, most notably John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, Alan Wake does enough on its own to set itself apart from them. Unfortunately, I can't say more without getting into spoilers, so here's your official warning to jump off if you haven't played the game and want to. 
From here on out, I'll be writing under the assumption that those watching have played the game and know the story, so I won't be giving too much context for what I'm talking about. Stephen King once wrote that nightmares exist outside of logic, and there's little fun to be had in explanations. They're antithetical to the poetry of fear. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation, and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest, and it's what we'll remember in the end. This quote is a brilliant way to open the game, because it tells you the gist of what Alan Wake is trying to do with its story from the get-go. It'll be a horror story inspired from western sources, the story will be left open to the audience's interpretation, but most importantly, it will be a story about self-examination. Alan Wake is a horror story about a man trying to write a horror story, celebrating, questioning, and sometimes critiquing the genre and its staples. Anyone familiar with horror media will be able to see many of Alan Wake's intentionally predictable reveals and scares coming a mile away. Characters making poor decisions that would all but ensure their deaths, not picking up on clear warning signs from obvious imposters or threats, the core cast characters devolving into tropes like the reluctant hero and the comic relief sidekick, a sequence where characters get drunk at the worst possible time, I could go on. Even at Alan Wake's initial release, this was by no means a novel concept. Even popular mainstream horror media like Wes Craven's self-aware slasher flick Scream made these kinds of observations of the sillier cliches of the genre. However, Alan Wake has one of the most novel takes on this kind of self-aware horror, with the added detail of how all the events of the game are written to happen exactly as they do by the protagonist, Alan himself. An author by trade, Alan comes to the conclusion that he can only write out the events of the game by depicting them as a convincing horror story. As such, he can only write said story filled with the familiar tropes and features of the genre. All of this is the reason as to why the aforementioned predictable choices, reveals, and scares happen the way they do, culminating with Alan sacrificing himself to something of a purgatory or hell by the end. Why? For all the talk of vague nonsense like needing balance, the real reason boils down to Alan feeling the need to meet horror expectations. He outlines this in the fourth chapter, claiming that his scripts must have victims, nearscapes, cliffhangers, and the hero, a role Alan writes himself into, almost has to die. However, the presence of Cauldron Lake is established to give artists near unlimited power to shape stories as they see fit. Alan isn't the first artist to take advantage of the power, as the in-game 70s metal band Old Gods of Asgard made contact with both the Dark Presence and used its power to invoke Norse mythology they previously used only as set dressing. Essentially, the power of the lake bent itself to their vision, rather than them needing to adhere to what they felt it or the genre demanded. The optional conversation you can hear between Odin and Tor Anderson actually spells out a lot of the lore behind how the power of the lake works. It's interesting stuff. Alan, on the other hand, he writes in a specific way that gets others killed and him trapped because he feels that, as a horror story, that's how it has to happen. The events of the game have to follow certain beats, and as such, he writes to meet them. There are other examples of characters also showing awareness to how their fates are dictated by Alan's manuscript. The FBI agent Nightingale reads a manuscript page, ironically dictated to us in another manuscript page, that outlines how he's going to die, which he recognizes moments before he actually does bite it. The hunter, who we know is aware of the manuscript, indirectly comments on how his actions aren't his own either. It's established how each character isn't actually making their own choices, but is instead following what Alan's script has laid out for them. In this regard, the real villain of Alan Wake isn't the Lovecraftian dark presence, which would itself be a slave to the story that Alan wrote. After all, there are manuscript pages written by Alan where events are dictated from the perspective of the presence itself. Alan shouldn't have any actual knowledge of this, unless of course the presence only feels and acts the way it does because Alan wrote it to feel and act the way it does. No, the true villain of the game would then be the genre of horror itself, more specifically Alan's narrow and trope heavy take on it. After all, why do all of the horrible events of the game take place? The victimization, cliffhangers, sacrifices, and other horrible events? Simple. Because Alan wrote it to happen that way. Because in his mind, the genre demanded him to do so. The thing is, while Alan himself may limit his work based on what he perceives as demanded by the horror genre, Remedy themselves didn't. As said earlier, from a gameplay point of view, Alan Wake doesn't limit itself based on expectations of either horror or action. 
It follows neither genre's expected trappings to a T, taking elements as the team chose. The contrast between Alan's cookie cutter adherence to genre and Remedy's more experimental take on it is no doubt intentional. Most likely, done to set Alan Wake as a game apart from its contemporaries, but for a more thematically relevant reading, it's showing how going off the beaten path creatively can absolutely be beneficial. Alan Wake is an extremely meta-driven self-examining horror story, and much of this critique and rumination is in service of Alan Wake's main theme. As a story about the process of storytelling itself, the take-home message of Alan Wake is to not limit yourself creatively, due to genre adherence or simply just following what others have done before because it worked. Don't be afraid to experiment and take creative risks. After all, the central conflict is between a writer fighting against an all-consuming force that lacked creativity of its own, and tries to beat this threat using the common expectations and trappings of the horror genre itself. The predictable, the familiar, the overdone, the cliched… you get the picture. The outcome? While Alan does beat the Dark Presence in the end, he ultimately does so by dooming himself to a purgatory state. Not quite dead, but certainly not alive. He had the ability to do practically anything he wanted to with the lake's power, so why does he do this? In his own words, because he's writing a horror story, and the hero almost has to die in a horror story. The genre demands it. I was never going to do Alan Wake justice, to be frank. This is a thematically dense game with some of the tightest writing you'll find in a big budget AAA release. There's so much I didn't touch on. The implied loop of the game's events, the many references to other pieces of media, the possibility that the game is mostly a venting piece for Sam Lake and his creative frustrations and anxieties, and I did not dare touch on the character of Thomas Zane and the can of worms that would open. I'm barely touching on the tip of the iceberg here, and my reading of the game is quite simple, surface level, and not at all a total look at Alan Wake as a whole. This is just my own take on the game, which I see as a celebration of creative potential, and the horror of an artist not fully realizing it. I'm a brainlet, what do you want from me? To end the review though, let's try to make some sort of meaning of the game's enigmatic and much discussed final line. It's not a lake, it's an ocean. As redundant as this is going to sound, let's go over the differences between a lake and an ocean. Outside of obvious differences such as salt and fresh water, you know, for the most part, for this stretch of a reading, I wanted to focus on a few aspects. A lake is contained, while an ocean is open and vast. An ocean has a far greater variety of content, i.e. biodiversity, than a lake does. And finally, a lake is still in calm compared to a wild and flowing ocean. Alright, with that out of the way, what some people might have missed about Alan's closing line is how it's an indirect callback to something said by Thomas Zane in the game's introduction. For he did not know that beyond the lake he called home lies a deeper, darker ocean green, where waves are both wilder and more serene. To its ports I've been. To its ports I've been. Again, while I won't be touching on Thomas Zane's role in the story too deeply, what is established on the surface level is that Zane is a writer just like Alan, albeit a better one. When confronted by the Dark Presence in a situation that mirrors Alan's predicament, Zane beat the creature not by following horror genre expectations, but by writing a paradox where he mostly wrote himself and in turn his involuntary work for the Dark Presence out of existence. In this regard, you could argue that Zane took a creative risk that Alan simply wouldn't have thought of. With all of this out of the way, let's move forward with the idea that lake and ocean are symbols for the creative process. The lake he called home can be seen as the formulaic, cliched, trope-heavy, so on and so forth. In other words, it's something that's creatively safe. In universe, Alan is viewed as something of a hack by both others and even himself to some degree. If Alan wrote all of the events of the game, down to what characters even say, it stands to reason that he wrote what this particular Taken says at the game's introduction. You're a joke. There would be a single readable sentence in your books if it wasn't for your editor. You'll never publish another one of your shitty stories, cause I'm gonna kill you. It's not like your stories are any good. Not like they have any artistic merit. You're a lousy writer. Cheap thrills and pretentious shit. That's all you're good for. Just look at me. Look at your work. 
Thereby, when given the near unlimited creative potential of Cauldron Lake, a clear nod to the power of artistic expression itself, he relies on horror genre expectations the entire time, and only at the very end, once he's already damned himself, does he realize what Zane already had. Outside of an artist's comfort zone, the familiar, beyond the lake he called home lies a deeper, darker ocean green, our waves are both wilder and more serene. Following my logic, the ocean here would be the creatively risky and experimental, the odd, unorthodox, and unique. While it's wild, it's also not constrained or still like a lake would be. It's flowing and filled with diverse possibilities. And all too late, Alan realizes that all throughout the game, he wasn't limited to horror genre tropes and expectations. He didn't have to write the manuscript the way he did. There didn't have to be sacrifices, and he didn't have to write himself into a hell of his own making. The power of Cauldron Lake and how it's channeled offered him an oceanic amount of possibilities and nigh limitless creative potential. Or, in Alan's own words, It's not a lake. It's an ocean. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for watching my Alan Wake review, which I spent far, far too long actually putting together. Uh, this is a long time coming, and I, again, I thank anyone who's paying attention for their patience. But, uh, at least into a couple house cleaning things. As I said in the video, I was not going to do Alan Wake justice. This is a dense ass game, and I'm clearly skipping over a lot. Like, everything about Tom Zane's role in this story just flies over my head. Because it just kind of circles and loops in on itself. I didn't want to like waste everyone's time with ideas and interpretations that, just be frank, I'm not confident on. I'm not even confident on the thing I put together. But you know, I got fake it because script video and everything. But onward. Uh, if you didn't notice, I did not actually touch on the DLC or the game's pseudo sequel, American Nightmare. I kind of looked at Alan Wake in a vacuum on its own, because the DLC doesn't really add much in my opinion, and American Nightmare is its own can of worms that uh, I really don't want to touch on at the moment. If people are interested in like, a review of American Nightmare, like, let me know. Uh, I have very conflicting feelings on it. I don't know if it is just completely phoned in or absolutely genius you know it's one of those things but yeah um I suppose the last house cleaning thing is i'm just gonna be taking a bit of a break for a while i mean you probably won't notice it because it's been two months since my last actual review and i had to cancel a stream this week <laughs> but yeah uh we're gonna be uh just uh, chilling out for a bit Gonna take some time off, relax, uh, attend to personal matters in my own life, and hopefully come back swinging with uh, some smaller videos and then get to some big ones I've had on the back burner for a while. Once again, thank you all for watching. Take it easy.